All right. Hi. Uh, welcome. We're here with uh, Charlie Clendening. Is that is that am I pronouncing that right? Clendening. It was close. Clendening. Awesome. Uh, thanks for coming on the show, Charlie. No problem. Uh, we were just uh, um, in the in the past on the podcast. We've talked uh, a little bit about um, COVID and how uh, it's been kind of co opted by the technological system. And like I, I think we've uh, seen that it's been kind of used in a way to push technology into uh, people's lives even further. Um, but we were talking just now uh, about how some of the technological causes of the pandemic. Um, and so did you? So anyway, so that? the so the comparison that I always think about when we talk about like COVID is that it was basically just like the Black Plague outbreaks back in the 1200s, where you know if you followed the roadmap of that, what happened was was that it started like. Theorize, theoretically started in like the Mongolian steppes, right? And then it spread to China because, you know, they're right next door within five years. And then China faced this massive outbreak. And then how it got to Europe was that when the, Mongol, when the Mongols had were doing their conquests and they had this massive intercontinental trade system, right? They were using the Silk Road to go from China to Europe. And that's actually how the bubonic plague in back in like you know the plague you think of black plague europe that's yeah. how it got there that's the only re it got there from slave ships that ended up in uh ukraine mm -hmm. right and and it's funny because because like covid basically did is basically super similar because you have this disease right that starts for whatever reason right it starts in china right yeah. and then and then due to these like these systems of international trade not even trade this it was just international commerce because you just look at flights well, like these people would just get on flights them and go all over the world. So by the time that like you would hear the news, China, like this is this happened back in the Black Plague. By the time you heard the news about the Black Plague from China, you had the Black Plague from China. Like that's how you got the news. And that's, yeah. it, it, it's COVID is super similar in that regard. Like uh, China has this like SARS-like disease, yeah. uh, 20 people affected. Oh, it's in France. And you're like, well, what the, what's going on here? Yeah, so so what, are the, what are some of the things that you've noticed, Charlie, about how technology is contributing to like the start of this pandemic and what's going on? Uh, see, this is an interesting thing because uh, we've been in a situation where we're growing in population and that means we're getting more dense. And as we get more dense, we're more interconnected, just like you're talking about with the plague. We, at that point, the density wasn't all the way in between where they were going, but there was a connection. So it was like two separate populations with a connection. So essentially they kind of were the same population with a connective route, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. But now we're at the point where the connections are not routes anymore. Everything's butted up against each other like a map where you have populations just sort of touching each other. And the population's not going down, it's going up every year. But one of the other things that's going down every year is the number of forests covering the earth. We cut it down and it doesn't grow back as fast as, you know, we use it up. We have to, you know, we have to burn it. We have to build houses with it. We have to remove it. One of the biggest causes of deforestation in Brazil is just to plant soybeans for cattle production. And that's mm -hmm. to feed the growing world population. Mm -hmm. So like, that's a leading cause of deforestation. But what that does is it exposes us to an incredible amount of zoonotic diseases, which are diseases that jump from animals to humans, because we'd never encounter that species naturally. We wouldn't be in, con you know, we wouldn't be in contact with that species of bat if we weren't, um, removing their habitat and doing all the things that we do to bring that population into contact with us and then utilizing it like a resource. And it's one of the things technology kind of does is turns everything into a resource. So then the bats become a resource. But the thing about bats is that they're mammals. So they can have similar diseases that can jump to human beings, but they also fly. Mm -hmm. So they fly over wherever they need to to feed, then they can transfer disease to maybe then that's in pr close proximity, then it jumps to them. Mm -hmm. Like uh, think about a vampire bat, they go and they bite animals and they suck up. They're all in, they're all mammals. So if it's a disease that goes back and forth between mammals, it can transfer between a different host if it's, but that increasing exposure is, is troubling because that's, uh, uh, it seems to have a history too. If you think about it, about every hundred years, there's a pandemic outbreak, which means we're mm -hmm. not fixing the root cause of what is going on. And, and it, the population has been going up the entire time. So you can say that's a root cause is the density. We're becoming like more connected, which is conversely more susceptible to disease outbreak. Mm -hmm. The more and more disparate you take, the more disparate populations become one population, 
Mm -hmm. it, that one population has that one weakness. So if you find that one weakness, that whole thing's gone. It's just a bigger loss. Yeah. Like it's, there's no way to sort of mitigate it. Yeah, exactly. So you're kind of like, you're speaking to like, like this, uh, um, the advantage of diversity. So like the one with COVID I think of is like the usage of masks, right? Where like you have the government that says masks are mandated, like, you know, we, we, you know, in like April, 2020. And then, like within two months, the the health like the the health workers in the government are like, oh, we don't even know if masks do anything. But we're not going to change the mandate because they might do something. But we don't know if they are. Mm -hmm. and, and no, so it just seems like 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 the, the the instantaneous like technological solutions to these problems just aren't even like. Do they even address the issue? Like it just seems like like there's like it's it, like the pace that like these epidemics move at. In a way, it seems like it moves faster than like our ability to respond to it with technology. Well, that could be a literal symptom of our density. If our density has a certain rate of transmission for diseases, like the thing about what you said, before we had agricultural societies, there weren't instances of outbreaks. So you take and transition to an agricultural system largely the world over, and then outbreaks become a symptom of that technology because agricultural societies are a technology in themselves yeah. it's a way to produce food to better suit your needs as a species so you employ that technology the world over and then that increases your population it increases your density and it decreases your movement not only that but if you're in an agricultural society you're destroying land to plant crops so there's entire species that you may have never come into contact with because there was maybe a 20 mile barrier between you and where they lived they would have never come into contact with you over thousands of years. They would have developed their own means to deal with the disease mm -hmm. or not. They would have died out. You know what I mean? Either way, but yeah, either way, nature does its course. Yeah. It would have been their problem, not yours. And if they died <laughs> out, that's their evolutionary disadvantage, not yours. But the point is there's a barrier and a safety net that protects you from that. There's functions to wild forests that people don't understand and don't value in present day society. A wild forest has the advantage of protecting you from things that would then only be happening in that area that would never come out of there because that's the place that takes care of them. That's the ecosystem in which they come about, they take their abiding, they take their decaying and extinction, all in that entire ecosystem. Sometimes it's not even going to come out of that. But if you destroy all these ecosystems or put them into a point where there are no more barriers, you expose yourself to all of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And th th I think you speak to like a big issue that I'm generally interested in, which is like people's um, perspective on the environment and what the uh, environment is compared to them, like, like their relationship with it. And uh, as you said earlier, technology gives the impression that everything that's quote unquote natural is a natural resource, that it's something for us to use in order to advance our- uh, It's very Lockean, yeah. It's, it's very, very much John Locke's perfect. theory of like, you know, you know, if you're following any, um, like when you take John Locke's like basic, like if you take the modern theory of property, right? John Locke basically said the world is like a massive resource and like you make products by mixing your labor with the natural world. And that's how you make like, Mm -hmm. goods and products and currency and uh and so like the entire like i don't want to say the entire but most of like that western view which i think like the john lockean view of property is the dominant form of like ownership that the western world uses as like an ideology and it literally takes nature as only a resource mm -hmm. it so, does i mean the, his entire theory was that if you extend your work to something it becomes your property and yeah. then governments were designed like when they say property is nine tenths of the law, that's because roughly ninety percent of the laws are literally just regarding property rights and property ownership laws. Yep, that's well, I'm in law school right now. I'm, I'm very well aware of that fact. It's not <laughs> yeah, it's not a fun that's, fact, that's, but I'm well aware of it. <laughs> that's partly why they say that the American government is based on John Locke's treatises on two government because that is a book about why you make how you make something your property. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what most of it is. I mean, the second half is just about God, but it's like you weirdly see that creep in here too. Mm -hmm. Let Did us you guys see. say that Christianity is a form of technology? I don't know. That's well, a good that, question. That, that, that's tough. I, I, I want to say that, like, if we're talking about, like, when that dude named Jesus was walking around, I, I'm 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 akin to the theory that Jesus was just like a dude that was literally had a sword in hand and he was slaughtering Romans and you know. <laughs> so that that's my theory. But like, but I think like the Christianity as an institution, especially like like the Catholic Church is so like the catholic church is literally like was the centralizing force of europe after well, is the, any of the Rome. Yeah. technology it seems like it might be if if we're um it's a social know, if, technology if, to me 
Jacques Ellul's notion of technique is really, I think, crucial to the conversation because it highlights the fact that technique is sort of a part of the human condition. Mm -hmm. No matter what we do in the entire history that we've studied ourselves, we're always looking for the more efficient means to achieve our ends, which essentially is what technique is. You're looking for a way to restructure, to make changes, to make it more efficient, because for some reason, our biological goal is to survive. So if you have a goal, then you're going to have technology. You're going to have a way to do it better. You know what I mean? Even if you're not aware of it, you're going to find a better way to do it. That's just evolution. Evolution is sort of like technique. It's sort of like a natural technique that we don't get to make conscious decisions of ourselves. Sort of like uh, that urge to do something better that then makes you do it better and reproduce then becomes a characteristic trait of that species. So in our particular condition, we're human beings that are employing techniques like social techniques to rigidly organize ourselves into something that's more easily able to live on the scale that we're living. You're able to live in populations like this because that's sort of the way that it naturally coalesces um, through technique means. Um, you can call them technological means, but, the, but I use the distinction with technology is that technology sort of, to me, comes up with an artifact. Technology to me has yeah, a machine. Techn Technique is an entirely social machine. It's an it, technique can be an abstract device. It can be uh, a church. It can be a government. It can be a city. It can be any type of social organization that is sort of like a, a non-existent machine. You know what I mean? You can literally take a class and set them a certain amount of feet apart and have them hand a ball from one end of the classroom to the other without moving. That's the, akin to a machine. Yeah. You see what I mean? Like you can do machine-like things without actual artifacts of technology. Right. So I think the bigger underlying factor of technique is that that's a part of our human condition. We're always going to be seeking technological means. But there's a caveat to that. There's a balancing part of our existence. There's, there's a balancing part of that where we say enough is enough. There's an anti-technique. And that's what I've been sort of trying to, I guess, sort of put together the, the importance of, I guess, and what I've been writing about recently, but it's like, if we don't apply anti-technique to sort of see the pitfalls of what we're using or doing or employing as techniques or technology, mm -hmm. we're going to find ourselves in a situation where we're like today. So you could, you could just literally look at capitalism and say that the people that are in charge of the capital capitalist system, they didn't employ any sort of natural anti-techniques to go, should I be doing this? Is enough enough? Like, is this really what I should be doing? So they are lacking that natural mechanism to say, ah, this is destructive. This is bad. This shouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily that they're lacking it. They're not exercising it. They're not doing it. So that allows them to take and take and take. And by that, I mean money, resources, whatever. And I'm talking about the people in capitalism that have all of the money and resources. And that's the way that they get it. There's no stopping mechanism that tells them to stop they just keep taking it right, so right. the importance of employing anti-technique seems more important than ever because you're going to find in all aspects of things people that don't employ anti-technique are going to go to one extreme and that extreme is going to cause a reaction when it swings back the other way yeah well i, I wonder would you, would you be able to say a little bit more about like what exactly is entailed in this kind of like anti-technique because I, I think i agree with you that we have a natural tendency to look for um, efficiency in things. We want to do things better in a certain way. So we have like this natural uh, tendency towards technique. Um, what, like, how would you characterize um, this like anti-technique drive that we should also be paying attention to? Is it like just ethical considerations or is it something deeper? Like, So what I was saying by anti-technique is that it's strangely a sort of a technique in itself, but you call it an anti-technique because it's the technique of balance it's the technique of uh, of scale it's the technique of whether things are in harmony or not it's the technique of you know what i mean you see that things are either going to work or they're not that's a technique that we've developed to sort of have the foresight of is this going to work is this good for us is this it's sort of the brakes you know if we're in a car it's the brakes we we technologically made the brakes but the brakes are to stop it mm -hmm. you know what i mean if you're going for a wall you hit the brakes so if we don't take the anti-technique, the, the breaks, so to speak, that we have, you know, intuitively, and we don't pay them enough attention, then we're just going to take everything to the extreme without hitting any of the breaks. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, a population that's going to the extreme. We have deforestation that's going to the extreme. We have 
governance that's going to the extreme. We have um, technological autonomy to the extreme. We have everything that we have is all the extreme because there's no there's no pump in the brakes. Like there's no taking the technique that we've developed to see whether what we're doing is working or not. Not, I mean, maybe that's not something that everything has, but human beings definitely have the ability to recognize when enough is enough. Yeah. I know when I've eaten too much, that's an right. impulse. <laughs> that's my brain going, "Hey, man, stop." <laughs> right. I, I think I think that one of the uh, one of the issues um, is that people are being, um, you know, I don't know if the right word is raised, but like we're like people are being like bred, quote unquote, by society to. Um, not have those breaks anymore like like you mentioned yeah. like uh 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 like we we generally know when we're not hungry one of the things i think about is that uh i i, I can't remember where i heard it from but um of like the difference in eating habits between the east and the west where yeah. um uh in the west we don't really stop eating when we're full we stop mm-hmm. eating when like our we plates empty plate. Yeah, yeah. Or when um, you physiologically cannot eat anymore, or yeah. your stomach would or like you're literally yeah. sick. Um, uh, but so, so it seems like um, in the West, especially, and uh, you know, unfortunately, in other places, as like Westernization spreads globally, um, that people uh, aren't don't really have um, those breaks. They're not. They're not. Um, they're not shown. Uh, yeah, those, they're not showing breaks exist. Yeah, exactly. They don't even know that there's something missing from them. They just yeah. keep going on uh, this technique path because they don't know anything else. So uh, I guess I, I wonder, what do you what do you think are some of the ways that we could um, uh, show people that there are breaks? Like how 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 can we like um, make people realize that the path that they're on isn't necessarily all good, even though they're being told every day by all these corporations that uh, technology is the way to go. Like, what is some, do you have any ideas of like some way to open people's eyes a little bit? Well, that's a difficult question. And there's a few different parts to the response. One of them is that it might not sound like it's a serious response, but it sort of is. And one of the things that I've taken to over the years is board gaming. And part of that is that it's a low tech alternative to act pastime activities in the modern era. It's just, you're physically moving things. You're physically face to face with somebody. You're moving pieces across the board. It's sort of bringing it back to more of an analog um, state of being. But the thing about it that I find pertinent to the anti-technology conversation is there are low technology ways to exist that are similar to the ways that we exist now. You can have entertainment, you can have leisure activities, you can play games, you can put on plays, you can, you can do all of this stuff without, you know, a high tech lifestyle. You can do all of these things. Like think about this. If you were living in a tribal civilization, you couldn't make a wooden stage and put on plays at night. Yeah, I mean, this. I mean, that was like, I mean, the you know, ancient Greeks. This is what they they were famous for their like their high culture when it came to like yeah. theater and that and the, like we don't. But it was just have, a like, stage outside. Yeah, they had a stage outside. Stage. They didn't write anything down. It was all like it was all you know. So we don't even know what the play like ninety nine percent of the plays were, but we know that they had a ton of like high culture that was entirely done like without tech. Without tech, yeah. Well, see, this is, this is the thing, too. I use those board gaming things as an example. It's just something that I'm drawn to, but you can use any of those examples like we talked about. Like you said, the real Roman high culture, those kinds of things. Operas, all that kind of stuff. Those were all low-tech inventions when they first came out. But the point being is you don't need an electronic speaker. You don't need to have all of this stuff to have these same sorts of things. Mm-hmm. So the other thing that's really interesting to me, too, about board games in specific is you can literally see a system in which you can employ a high amount of technique to no end. It doesn't matter. Hmm. You can you can literally take an impulse to put these technological claws into something, but it's just a game. It doesn't affect anything. You don't then go out and the forest is all cut down because you cut the most wood down in the game. It's just, it's a game. You can do it. You know what I mean? You can, you can exercise some of these impulses that we have uh, in a safer way. So it, it, it's, it sounds silly, but it's, there, there's small little pieces to the puzzle that you yeah. can put together. Well, you, you, specifically in regards to board games, I actually relate to a lot because my dad, when he was growing up in the, oh, I'm not going to say his age, but, um, <laughs> um, but when he was growing up, like he, he played a ton of those old school war board games, right? Where yeah. it'd be like the battle of North Africa. And you'd literally have like a, it, literally, this is a real board game where it's a, like a, yeah. it's like a I'm map, it's really 10 feet by 20 feet. <laughs> and yeah. you, your Rommel against you know Montgomery, and that's literally. Tell them how long it takes. 
Yeah, oh, it takes like it's literally a game that takes like <laughs> it's a nine it's month a game. Hour game. Yeah. <laughs> it's literally a game that takes literally like months to play. But yeah, like my dad spend... always talks about the board games he used to play growing up. He just had him and his friend. Like it's his fondest it's... memories of our these board games, and it's yeah. Well, think about this. Could you solve, instead of having an actual war, could you simulate those with a system of rules on a piece of paper? Let's say two tribes got into a fight. Could you sit down and have an intellectual skirmish without people having to die or any violence being employed? And I want to say there's actually uh, there's actually some cultures in West Africa that do that. They do non-violent wars where they just kind of awesome. show up in fields and just, they're just like, let's either suss out our differences or we'll have like, we'll basically have like like a pinball duel, basically, like the equivalent of a pinball duel. And then they'll be like, oh, you won. here's the cattle for the year. See you later. We'll do this again next year. And it's just like these symbolic wars, basically. That's what they call it. it. That's, it just shows you that's possible. But that's, yeah. that's the thing. Would you call it technique or anti-technique? That could be the technique of employing anti-technique to say, we shouldn't be doing these wars. We should be trying to not kill each other because – you know, that's better than just murdering each other left. And right. <laughs> but, it, you know, that's the thing. That's why I say the anti-technique part's really just a term for a form of technique like the breaks. It's it's the the part of us that says that that's enough. But what I was going to say, too, when you said that, how do you show somebody that the things that they've been sold as progress are lies? Yeah. And it's that's a difficult thing. And the, the problem with that is every time you tell somebody what lie they've been sold, the same lie comes in as the solution. Yep. Your technology is the problem and the solution. And that's the problem is you can't, you, it's, you, it's hard to show somebody that just because it's the problem and the solution that they can't keep finding solutions with it. But it's like, you're not focusing on the fact that it is the problem too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's it, part of the problem that gives you the solution because that solution creates more problems for them to find solutions to. <laughs> I mean, I think like the most obvious example of this, just to like, just to keep going, is like population, like, like population, yeah. like the massive population is created by a technological, like technological, like, like they basically were like, we can get fertilizer from the sky. Let's do that. Yeah. And then like food production <laughs> skyrocketed. We have too many people. What do we do? Genetically engineer food to make more food. And then, <laughs> and then, oh my God, we have 8 billion people now. And it's like, what do we do now? And it's like, to stop with all that. Just don't do yeah. those yeah. things so, yeah, anymore. Yeah. People keep looking for technological solutions to these problems, which introduces more, more problems. problems. So it's this yeah. chain. So it's, yeah. it's, 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 a, and it's definitely a difficult thing to show people that they're in this chain. Um, I, uh, uh, I think that one of the, um, like introducing people to this paradox is really difficult. And it's, and, and part of it is that there's like this, um, it's not just, I, I think it's not just a belief in technology. It's like a faith. It's like, it's like yeah. science is, yeah, science and religion. technology yeah. is the new religion. And people just in, innately believe that uh, somebody somewhere will invent something that will make this all better. That's the faith in the solution because it's always provided the solution till this, this point. But there's mm -hmm. something I wanted to point out here. And uh, what I was thinking about just now is that in order to make, it, it actually stemmed from board gaming, because there's lots of ways to make things more efficient in board gaming, but you see it in a more complete picture. Mm -hmm. But So what, what I'm trying to get at is that the, in order to make anything more efficient, there are sacrifices in other areas. It's the only way to do it. So mm -hmm. when you make anything more efficient, like let's say, are you guys familiar with role playing games like Dungeons and Dragons at all? I, I, oh, played, yeah. uh, I literally like we have to schedule these interviews around my Dungeons and Dragons sessions. So okay, yeah. so then you, this is this will go back to character creation. When you create a character, you have like six different fields in which you have numbers, but you can't take away from one of the numbers to add to the, you can't add to one of the other numbers without taking away from one of the other numbers during the creation process. You have X amount of points, you allocate them as you know you see fit. Yeah, so if you, do, if you do like the traditional dice roll method, like you get six, you know, you get the six yeah. rolls, you drop the lowest, good luck with the other five, basically. I like point by. Oh, you do you do 3.5? No, I'm a point by, man. I like to buy my points. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. The point by is fun because you can just put, well, you can make the characters more similar to how you want. 
But I've done the rolling thing. The rolling thing's fun because you can get a bunch of high numbers and then you're just overpowered. I made a character literally last weekend that was like, it was a ranger, right? And I rolled like, a, I rolled 18, 18, 17, 9, 8, 8. And I was like, this is a character. Like, here we go. My <laughs> character is unintelligent. This is going to be great. <laughs> They'll just be tripping over themselves. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you can see though that when you're trying to, so let's say you want to do some minimizing and maximizing when you're making this character. You can take, if you're doing a point by method, and you spend all your points and you want to say, you say, oh, they need to be, they need to have better aim. They need to aim better. You have to make that dexterity go up, but you have to take those points from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So that causes another problem. So what you're doing is the technology is selling people on just rearranging stats. Right. Technology is selling people on the fact that, oh, there's a problem here. Let's rearrange the stats. Like so then you rearrange the stats but then everybody's not focused on, oh, you just took all the points out of wisdom. Yeah. So now you're just fumbling around, not able to see what you just did. So then you go, oh, okay, well, now we got to pump the points back into wisdom. <laughs> Boom, you pump the points back over there. You're just shifting them back and forth. So yeah. it's like a little shuffle. It's not like anything's changing. We're, we live with finite resources, just shuffling them around. And it's like a big illusion that people are being sold. Like the, It's mm -hmm. like a magic trick where they're like, oh, I fixed the problem. And you're like, yeah, but you just took it all from right there. So what the hell are you doing? Yeah. And yeah, and like you said, they're just made they're made to just focus on the positive. They're they're sold this idea that technology is giving them all the positives without any of the benefits. We we can we can just use the same amount of resources that we've always been doing, but just do it better. Uh, but they keep it hidden what they're actually taking that from. Or even like I'm thinking of like we're how manufacturing jobs were just decimated in the 80s and 90s, right? And uh, oh look, we don't have any pollution anymore. It's all in China. We don't have any pollution anymore. <laughs> don't don't worry about it. We just shift it over there, but we're not gonna notice it. Yeah, yeah. no. I like, I like, I like, I like, I like, I like, I like this D and D metaphor. That's all. I really like this metaphor that you let it land. Really, because I'm thinking of like today, like when you look at like obesity rates in America, right? Like, like we literally made a society. We got rid of all the physical, manual labor jobs, so we shifted all strength. Strength, strength is a dumb state. To intelligence, and now we have these, <laughs> this massively obese population that can all use computers, and that's what we're dealing with now, and that's what we have to do going forward. Yeah, the movie Wally -E is about strength as a dump state. <laughs> wow, yeah, you're right about that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's basically what they're doing, and the problem is they're just being sold an illusion, but you can't tell them that the problem and the solution are connected like this. Yeah, like it's not a separate problem and a separate solution. They're the same thing. It's the same character sheet that you just keep pushing stuff around on. Like you can't just, that's the, uh, you can't really, I don't know. You just got to talk when you're talking about how can you show people that it's, it's hard. Cause especially when we're, when Jack Alou calls it the technological milieu, we're stuck in it too. We're doing a podcast via zoom because we're stuck in a pandemic caused by technology problems where if we go well, out like, and try to interact in person the government will arrest us like it's right <laughs> like you, we're, you, we're still stuck in the technological milieu ourselves mm -hmm. so it's like i mean all anybody has to do i mean you this is the other troubling thing look at the disinformation campaign by the trump administration that's a technology that's a technique you overcame the truth as an obstacle by telling people that it's not true mm -hmm. that's a social technology it's a technique they had a technique of dealing with problems politically by just spreading disinformation and saying it's not real, but it worked. Mm -hmm. So it's like, there's all these myths that you can convince people of that aren't even true. You could tell people all of this stuff and show them all of this stuff. And all they got to say is fake news. Yeah. And it's that, over. Yeah. At that point, the truth has been overcome and you're like, I, what do we do? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it, it's, it makes it, uh, it makes our job so much harder because now pe people won't believe anybody about anything. No. Every like truth has become subjective in this really dangerous way, yeah. <laughs> and it's like making it harder to convince people of uh, any illusions that actually are there because like they, it seems like they can be convinced one way or the other that anything is an illusion, and yeah. so then they just default to like, oh, I'm just not going to worry about those things. I'm just going to like return to my complacency and like uh, keep watching Netflix. And, the and, amount and just, of statistical okay. abuse that you see in the news media every day is insane. You can just make a stat to make anybody believe whatever you want. But if you've taken a statistics course, I get mad at all of them because I say that's not how you calculate numbers. You're you're manipulating people. <laughs> oh, no, I know. I mean, I'm, this is a thing. I even noticed this when I was growing up. Is you flip on the news and they're like, "Oh, scientific study." Here's a pull quote from that study, and it's just like the most out of. It's a hundred people from the local mall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or like, like or like, you guys have generalized study that says exercise will kill you. Here's a quote from this three thousand page study. 
There you yeah, go. There's well, your answer. Move on with your life. And yeah. It's more likely a questionnaire of 100 people at the local mall in which one of them died from a heart attack on the treadmill. So <laughs> they, our conclusion is exercise will kill you. Yeah. Which then you're like, you're not wrong, but you're not right. You're not, no. you're you're not, not. right either. You're not wrong. You're manipulative, which I would argue is wrong, but that's a subjective thing in itself. Yeah. Like you, like, the part yeah. of the problem with truth though, too, is that there is no concrete definition of truth, whether it's subjective or objective. Yeah. You can't solidly define it, but that's, I mean, if you're going by Wittgenstein standard, that's a pitfall of language, but mm -hmm. we've so far managed to get by with it. So, well, so, so you used a word earlier uh, when you were describing, like you were talking about uh, with, with, the, with Trump and the, 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 this line, but you called it a myth. Right. And I really enjoy that you called it a myth because it reminds me, oh, what was his name? There's a German author named uh, Spengler, I want to say. I forget what book he wrote, but he wrote about this issue where he talked, he was talking about technological society. And he was like, you have this issue where we're getting to such a large and large scale that like, because in the, because in like the 1850s and six, like in the middle of the 18th, 19th century, when industry was really picking up, people started becoming disillusioned with like the church and, and, and basically, and Nietzsche talks about this too, you know, the twilight, but um, that basically like by the time world war one hit, we had to reinvent myths. Like we had to re bring back myths because society was at such a large scale and that individuals were so far away from the actual like functioning nature of society that you had to come up with a myth to explain to people why the society is structured in such a way that it is. Yeah. I mean, th that's the thing. You have to ask yourself, is myth a necessary part of any illusion? Hmm. Like, we we have this illusion that technological society is the answer, and in order for it to maintain the illusion that it's the answer, it has to have an ancillary myth as to why. Mm -hmm. Why is it the answer? Well, here's a story that we made up about why it's fixing us. Yeah, like It's just, it, it's, it's sort of corollary. If you take anything, it's sort of like, um, if you take anything and put it in a position of power, for a long enough time, and there's any element of mystery, myths will grow up around it. They just pop up to surround it. You see it in any kind of population anyways. I just started watching a documentary about um, Skinwalker Ranch. It's like a UFO, paranormal, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. all that kind of stuff. But the there could be nothing there, and it's literally just a mystery where everyone is coming up with their own myths in their head that they explain all of this with. In order to have the illusion that something is the answer, something like technology being sold as the answer. It's not a physical thing. There's a lot of mystery there. There's a lot of, where is it? You yeah. know what I mean? You can't flip a rock over and go, here's technology. I found it. Let's get rid of it. Let's throw it in the, throw it in the dump. Yeah. So there's a mystery element because people are used to having a physical embodiment of something. You Like when there's nothing there, our minds will invent things. You can literally look at studies of eyewitness reports and crime cases. They're not accurate because our brains don't have the information, so it makes up all the details. It's or, or it hears an, or it hears like what the most famous example I can think of is uh, it was a, a Ford's shooting where everyone reported that the guy was the guy that shot him was wearing a yellow shirt, and uh, everyone that all the eyewitnesses like he's wearing a yellow shirt, and it's because like the news broad news broadcast like thirty minutes after the event. They were like, oh, the man was wearing a yellow shirt. So all the witnesses that actually saw this dude was wearing like a red shirt. They all saw the <laughs> red shirt. But when they like went to the, you know, the went news to, reporter. Yeah. Well, but the news reporter was like, he was wearing a yellow shirt. So all the witnesses who were even there when they went to do the depositions at the trial and shit, they were like, oh, he was wearing a yellow shirt. And it's like, how did you like, do you not like your eyes literally saw something different? But like they literally heard like, you know, after it happened, they reheard it. They reimagined it because of this like conflicting information that they either had to reject or absorb and they decided yeah. to absorb it. So we yeah. fill in mysteries. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that's the thing. You can just expand that to a larger scale where technology is the answer and there's no justification for it. So we fill in the blanks with a myth mm -hmm. as to why everybody's got their origin stories. Like think about, think about how as human beings today, we talk about the invention of the wheel, the invention of fire. Like these are stories that are still told on a mythical scale to today. I'm not saying they're myths. I'm saying we've sort of aggrandized them and made them legendary tales of human innovation, yeah. which I mean, they are, but I'm saying it, it translates to further down the line. We're like, yeah, our machines are saving the world. Yeah. Like that's just the translation later on down the line to, well, we don't have to do it. And we've sort of, if you think about the fact that we sort of depend on machines to sort of autonomize a lot of things, Mm -hmm. 
we've sort of put ourselves in that position. So if we put ourselves in that position, it's going to be hard to convince ourselves that that's not the answer. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's just, I like, I like that you bring it up with like the case of fire and the wheel that like we, uh, it's weird how we like we hold those up as like these great milestones in humanity yeah. where we created these technical inventions. Like so, people were just in dregs before that. Yeah, like yeah, like like why don't we have a great myth about the caveman that's like sitting and just like sitting by the fire and just like looking at a tree and just enjoying looking at that tree or just I just want to see him sitting by a fire roasting a piece of meat going, "You know what? I could make this." Yeah. <laughs> that fast forward and we're here now doing zoom meetings <laughs> yeah exactly eating, eating uh fucking fake hamburgers from burger king I have a, I have a listen if it's an impossible whopper how did they make it yeah right oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no clue it's not impossible then huh you made it yeah <laughs> I, I do like just thinking about this this is something that we that this just constantly gets constantly brought up uh in our podcast just because it's always like like food like food in the western world is just such a bizarre thing yeah. now like uh we so like uh so like you know in, in the western world like you have to cook chicken all the way through or you will get sick and it's because the chickens are so old and so filled with things that we aren't supposed to eat that if you don't literally like cook cleanse it all the them. way through like literally like cleanse it by fire you will get sick with like a major disease well like yeah in india like yeah you can eat pink chicken like it's fine they don't have like their, their chickens do not have the same like mass produced diseases that ours do. Yeah, yeah. well, their, their populations are just different. Like they don't have, like it's, you, you, you know the difference between there's type A and type B milk? I actually don't know the difference. Tell so there's two, di- there's two different types of milk. And one of the theories as to why we have such a large degree of lactose intolerance in the West, like America, Central America, stuff like that. We use a different type than they do in Europe and Asia and stuff like that. There's just like, it's a different type of protein. You guys, that's, I'm not, I'm not like fully versed in it, but I, I looked at a few studies about it, but that's the, the difference in the levels of lactose intolerance is crazy. But when you look at like type A versus type B milk, but um, yeah, like I said, I'm not an expert on that, but it's something interesting right. to look up. But when you see different populations that grow their own characteristics where you're like, wow, there's two different types of milks and I, you might not be as allergic to one as the other. Yeah. So you see them like coming up with their own solutions to things. So it's like a natural solution to come up with your own solutions to things, which is why I think it's come all the way down to human beings. But think about this. What would you think Rossell would say about the affluence of America today and how we've put food on a pedestal? We're aggrandizing it on a daily basis. There's entire food networks that are just yeah. shows about food. So it's like it's worked its way into the ether in affluent societies that we've had this weird relationship of idolizing food. I mean, traditionally, though, like when you think about it, like food was the sign of affluence, like pre-industrial societies, because when you had a good year of a harvest, that's when you had a lot like food was literally your a sign of wealth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, now we just have food in and like coming out of our ears. So we just have this like natural historical inclination to associate but, food with affluence. But but it's weird. Every day like, was the harvest day. Yeah, yeah. Every, every day is harvest now day. every day is a harvest day where there's a feast on TV every single day. So it sort of like fetishizes it. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's not, yeah. it's that, not something that you you don't look forward to a harvest feast. You look forward to a nightly feast. Exactly. It takes it takes the it takes like the intrinsic value out of food. And I, yeah, I think well, it just of, warps the relationship. Yeah, and the part of it too is that uh, um, people. Uh, you know, when, when people don't, you know, if every day is the harvest, it, it kind of reduces the value of it. You don't really care yeah. about it as much. And it's, it's the, also- uh, the flaw of abundance. If anything's yeah. abundant, you don't care anymore. Exactly. And, and I think part of it too, is that uh, people, it's become so abundant that uh, they're, they're looking for ways to put value back into food, but the way they're doing it is like through um, artists. Like raw- yeah, like like yeah, artistry and like raw experience and like the five senses is like if I can enhance what my five senses are experiencing, um, then like that's quote unquote better food. But uh, uh, it's totally taking, uh, it's totally ignoring the fact that like food is like uh, this um, interconnected thing that like feeds your body and affects the environment, and that it's very like, intimate experience. It's a very intimate experience, which and makes it's not, it easy to exploit. Yeah, it does. I like this because idea. it has a natural inroad. I like this idea you brought that, that food is fetishized because I'm just thinking like because we're talking about like the harvest right and back before like pre Christianity Europe like if you look at all the like you know you look at like the Slavic pagans and the Nordic pagans like harvest time was like the like it was the time of the year because it also symbolized not just like that you got food for the winter but it was also like 
symbolic of death. Like that's when they had the, the entire cycle of like life and death. The entire mythos is built around like the flow of the seasons and, um, and, and you use the word fetishize. And that's like, you see this a lot too with like, uh, like in the modern day, just j- like we took these ancient cultural traditions that actually had like this symbolic and practical value and we fetishize it. So like the one that the one, so we, we used to go to a lot of music festivals. Right. And, um, and one of the big so things that happens at music festivals oh, is that like, is that old pagan religions are just massively fetishized. Like people are yeah. like bringing back like horoscopes and crap. And it's like, you people don't even know why yeah, horoscopes no existed in the first place. <laughs> like, why are you doing this? Like you're, you're <laughs> bastardizing like an 8,000 year old tradition and you have no clue what you're doing with it. And well, um, no, I just, I like that you said fetishize. That's all. I really like that word because it describes a lot of like, a lot of like the excess culture we have. I say it because fetishists can't get enough. Yeah, if you're fetishizing they're... something, you can't get enough of it. Like that, anything that becomes fetishized is when people are literally stuffing themselves full of it and cannot get enough. But um, I, I had a point, you were just, what were you just saying a second ago? Sorry, I got distracted About by the pagans and music. Yeah, there's no such thing as pagans. It's literally like a 10,000 disparate religions that they all just said, oh, you're pagans. Yeah, yeah. Not a thing. you can't it's like when people talk about antifa you can't write antifa a letter yeah. like, there's no there's no antifa headquarters seattle yeah there's no seattle. pagan headquarters there's no pagan church that has a pope like you can't go there and be like hey where's mercury at we need to find him yeah. it's mercury season you know so like when we talk about like horoscopes is like horoscopes were literally like how the babylonians mapped the universe like that was their <laughs> conception of the cosmos and yeah. i like and I, every time anytime anyone brings up horoscopes i'm like all right so who made them like tell me about them and they're just like oh i don't know like look at the stars and i'm like so like son of a bitch like like it's just like it's like it's cultural ignorance really yeah. oh my god then you just go outside and point up and go tell me it looks like a bear and i'm telling you you're lying <laughs> <laughs> right but I mean, think about that though. They never had TV though, so I'm sure their imaginations were a little more active than ours. They also probably had a lot it did, maybe did look like a bear to them. <laughs> I'm wondering if we need some kind of anti myth uh, to bring about to like help replace this technological myth that everybody. Well, is one of the things that I've come to realize. So later in my life, I started to study Chan or Zen a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And it's like, uh, it's less of, a, if you really read the actual core text, it's not really a religion, it's more so a philosophy. Right. But it's this weird philosophy of like negation and emptiness. So it's like, if you produce an anti-myth, you're sort of doing the same thing and giving a myth. Mm-hmm. But if you make it your focus to just dispel all the myths, then there's no myths to, you know, there's no myths to take care of. So if you're making the point to just dispel all the other myths without producing another myth Mm -hmm. then there's going to be nothing to defeat later on Um, you can negate it you can negate it by negating it without having to replace it you can just say this is a myth and point out how it's a myth and when they say well then what is it say there's no myth it's a myth there's no it is what it is it's if i was to describe a myth to somebody it's just words that we've invented like what about a time before there was words what myths were there then Mm -hmm. There weren't any. They're all illusions. They're things that we made up. So why replace an illusion with another illusion? If you want people to see reality, don't give them another illusion. Yeah. I w- do, do you think that, because um, I wonder if, if we were to somehow dispel the myths and, uh, um, you know, try to strive for a better society in that way, um, I worry that people have like a natural tendency to mythicize like their reality in some way i feel like there there will always be some kind of mystery that people want to create a myth around or even just for like right. purposes of escapism in a way or maybe but like uh um not maybe not even escapism but like i don't know do you, do you think that we can yeah, really no, I, that is definitely a problem to overcome but i mean like in my personal view sort of the idea that you should dispel myths is sort of a replacement to that myth but it's not a myth itself Mm -hmm. you know what i mean uh it sort of functions in the same sphere of your brain but it's just an undoing of an undoing it's an unlearning it's a it's a examining it's the application of anti-technique to everything without making it its own thing it's you know what i mean it's like i can make it then my goal in life to question things as opposed to accepting them and that's not a replacement myth. 
but it sort of functions in that same search for answers right. because the myth has a you got the biggest thing to me is to replace the function of the myth mm -hmm. the function of the myth is to explain things to say you know what the case is why it's here why is the big function of the myth mm -hmm. so if you can dispel the myth and explain that there is no why it's just it we're just here like on a philosophical level there's no why to any of this we're just here this is what it is is it a myth or is it not a myth mm -hmm. like it's not about what is the myth it's is it a myth or not right you know what i mean it's not about replacing it it's you look at the techno industrial system and think is this destructive or not mm -hmm. to me the answer is yes which means it's a problem and we should do something about it right. but that's the central function of the myth is is this something that is helping us or hurting us and the function of the myth is to justify it tell, tell us why it is that case yeah like when we like the myth that we make up about the techno industrial system is that it's something we did it's good for us it's the solution to all of our problems it's going to bring us to a great world one day yeah yeah it, it, that's just when i say myth it's not like an elaborated story necessarily no, yeah. it doesn't have so there's, to be. No, there's no smoke and mirrors and it's very straightforward of a myth yeah yeah it's just it's it the myth is that it's actually progress that it's actually good for you there's a bunch of half truths and untruths that are just a whole part of it so it's like if you can dispel all that and sort of deal with it in a different way but still kind of do the same function you can sort of further it but like i said i mean i don't know i have i personally i don't think i'm i don't think anybody knows the answers no yeah definitely. which is the troubling part because anybody that anybody that's causing problems with these technology things are generally people that come in saying they have the answer yeah yeah, I, that that I think that's a that would be a, that's a great thing to like I think promote for people in, in in the efforts of like trying to dispel this. Add, add in this little thing of like if anybody is confident, it comes to you confident with an answer to your answer, problems. Yeah, call call bullshit on them. Yeah, <laughs> they, hey, I'm gonna need a few citations here, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> what studies are you using? Uh, do you guys know? Uh, are you familiar with Derek Jensen? I don't think so. No. Derek Jensen, he wrote Endgame. He wrote uh, he wrote a bunch of like social commentary, philosophy books. Endgame is really interesting because it's about how civilization is inherently violent. Okay. And it's like the end of that. Or no, what is it? Uh, Culture of Fear or something like that. Um, he just they're they're thick, but they're really interesting reads because he's got a pretty interesting perspective about like the inherence of violence and the inherence of destructiveness in society and stuff like that. But uh, he wrote like sort of like a kids book, I want to say, with uh, a female author, and it's called like Fifty Things That You Can Do to Help Make the World Burn or something like that. And it's about <laughs> all of these myths. Like it's about the myth of recycling. Like if you think you're saving the world by recycling, where do you think they do all this stuff? It's a factory. Do you yeah, think yeah. there's no chemicals involved? Do you think there's no waste? Do you think that like it's a solution? Because it's not. <laughs> but it's all about 50 things that are like that, that are being sold to you as like solutions to fix the world. But there's like this whole dark side to it. Like even this, if you're to switch over to renewable energies, where are you going to get the metals for that? Where are you going to get the acids that maintain the batteries? What are you going to do for maintenance? Where are you going to put all of the scrap? Like four places in the world that it's all in like highly like damaging weight. Like, I mean, like the biggest lithium mine in the world is in like, I think it's in New Zealand. And it's like just this, you can see pictures. It's just this massive open pit and it just has like chemical runoff. Yes. That just goes into the ocean every single day, and that's where your batteries come from. And there's nothing, yeah. there's nothing you can do about it. it yeah. So, like, that's not you. the solution to the environmental collapse that we're facing is electricity, if yeah. that's where it all comes from. But it's like, how do you, how do you deal with that? I, I, I don't know. It's that's the that's the spot we're all in. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? You want to say that beer is a technological advance? Then how the hell do they do it in ancient Egypt? Yeah, boom, there you go. Uh, boom, got him. You don't have to get rid of every part of modern society to have a low technology existence that's more sustainable. Like yeah. there's there's all this kinds of stuff that people don't realize people invented before electricity. Like we were just talking about, fermentation of drinks is not a scientifically complicated process. No, yeah. Neither that's actually, is that's actually something that I always thought about. Like when you look at like 
like like when people say like what would we do without all the technology like how would we combat diseases and it's like well we have germ theory well, even if we don't have technology we know how germs work like don't yeah, shit in your so- water supply like <laughs> do people not know how soap works yeah, you know, I'm still, I'm, no, I'm serious. I, what I mean is specifically, do you, like, soap doesn't kill germs. Yeah, no, it just it just picks them up. Yeah, it just it, it just washes it thing. off like dirt. It coats yeah. all the germs in a like a hydrophilic barrier as opposed to hydrophobic, and then they just fall off like sand. Like, they're not dead; they're just washed down the drain. Yeah, exactly. Oh man, that's so weird. I found that out, and I was like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> well, <laughs> right that's why they can't sell antibacterial soap anymore. Yeah, no, they, they outlawed it in like what 2017 because they kept yeah. getting massive uh strep outbreak. Not strep, it was no, it was staff. They got staff outbreaks because yeah. they kept but, breeding staff superbugs in hospitals because of it. Yeah, the, well, they said that there's literally no medical evidence that suggests that antibacteria soap is what needs to be done. Like the soap washing it off of you is all that needs to be done. And that's not high tech at all. You make that out of soap and lye or yeah. sap and lye. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like uh Scribino and I were talking about a while ago the I think after one of his classes about how we were talking about even literally just knowing about soap in a primitive society would have cut the infant mortality rate in, in at least half if you just washed the baby after they were born and kept them clean no, like, or like even that like or even like this is something that like uh that uh because Heidi's like in medical school so I ended up going I always go down to like medical rabbit holes and one of the things that I always notice is that like like one of the big issues that we have with like like our big issue with like like ch- childbirth is that we just do it wrong. Like we literally have the woman lie down on her back, and it's like no. If you go like if you watch like the if you go watch the documentaries of like primitive societies today, like they give birth, the woman's standing up, she's pregnant, she's like one second, kid drops out, <laughs> here's the kid. They they don't they just squat because that's like the natural way you're supposed to give birth, and we just don't do it. But you got to think about this in a way that makes any sort of like biological sense anymore. And it's just like, it's, it's baffling that that's why we do it like that. But did we separate ourselves from that practice for long enough that our bodies have changed, at least as a population? I'm not sure. It might not work the same way that it did before. We might have smaller waists. We might not have the same ability to just drop kids out like that anymore. Well, it doesn't, I think think we change. Cause, cause like this is, this is part of one of uh, Kaczynski's arguments is that um, uh, he thinks that we um, have advanced too quickly for our genetics to catch up. He, he thinks yeah. that there's no way that like our bodies have adapted to this new lifestyle no. uh, because it's just happened too, way too fast. So um, you, I don't are know. Are you familiar I, with, uh, I think it's Ivan Illich's tools of conviviality? Yep, totally. That's the same point is that there's scales that we're evolved to live on and that we're far beyond our scale. That's sort of an example of anti-technique that I was going to bring up is that he's pointing out that there are scales and that we're outside of that scale. The anti-technique is knowing you're outside of that scale and giving it import, saying this is a thing. We're outside of our scale. We can't live at this scale. We got to bring it down a notch. We, yeah, like, like, that's I, what I mean. That's the sort of the breaks, the pump and the breaks, where you point out, guys, there's a balance, there's a scale, there's a level with which we can live with some of this stuff. And right now is not it. Yeah. <laughs> right now is not it. We've got to rediscover our balancing scales and get back to that point. Yeah. But we also have to dispel the myths that our balancing scales are uh, weighted. I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. So if you were to listen to some of the technocrats, they're going to they're gonna weight the scales when it comes to balancing. So, yeah. I mean, that's another aspect to it. You have to learn to dispel those myths and say, hey, this guy's full of shit. Okay, he's not, he's not trying to help you. <laughs> like, <laughs> listen, Elon, we're not going to put computers in our brains because it's not going to help anybody. Just knock it off. Yeah. But he's not going to do it, but he's going to tell you he will. That's weighting the scales. That's like mm-hmm. sort of trying to find a way around people's innate, Think, well, think about this. This is something that sort of triggers your natural anti-technique reaction. When Elon Musk says he wants to put a computer chip in your brain that will interface with your brain the same way that like a phone would do, everybody's initial reaction for the most part is, ooh, yeah, right. I don't know if I want that. But see, that's that natural, that's that natural inclination to make a decision and say, that doesn't seem good. Yeah. That doesn't seem like it's going to benefit me to the point that I want that. It's so, I mean, what's interesting example. is that you can, you can analyze, you can literally, an, an, oh, I, I hate this word because I never say it, analogize that to like something like something like social security numbers are basically the same thing in principle is that before social security numbers, you ask me, what do you think happened before the 30s when Roosevelt came out with like identification numbers for everyone? 
And people were like, the, I have no clue how society worked. And it went along just great, but the government wanted to track people. Were there like, people before the that was like that's like and so I guess what I'm driving at is like you could you can like anal like analogize like the brain chip to social security numbers in a direct way because they're both in principle trying to attempt the same thing. It's mm -hmm. attempt it's just like attempt at like controlling it's it's not attempt to go it's like where are these people? Like where like if they know where you are, they can find you in a way. And that's kind of what like the brain chip, that's the fear behind the brain chip, and that's ultimately what the social like social security was for in the first place like that's why you have an ssn now your oh, entire yeah. identity is based around this 10 so, digit number i want to say yeah three two four four it's eight nine nine, nine digits yeah nine yeah, okay. I, was about to say. I know mine by heart i had to go through <laughs> the numbers in my head so i mean think about this though in terms of what i ivan illich was talking about for a convivial scale uh, if social security numbers or some sort of tracking mechanism is an essential part of living on the scale that we're on right now that's the part of the problem like there's all these things um like okay uh this is something i want to bring up and this is something that i would like to hear your guys thoughts on yeah. there's something that uh professor screener and i used to talk about and i forget what he called it but i called them i want to say emergent properties mm -hmm. we're talking about mind as an emergent property um, but there's emergent properties in all kinds of other different things, as in there's things that you don't see until they're manifest because there's no indication that they would be there until they manifest. Mm -hmm. As in, is tracking a necessary part of functioning in a society like we have on this scale? That uh, Tracking the people of the population could be an emergent property of governance. Like you may at a certain point have to track the people, otherwise governance won't work. And the problem is on this scale, it may have to be done with numbers. But that's not to say that it's right or that it's something we should do. It's just to say that this level necessitates it. So then is this the scale we should be on? Yeah. Well, that's actually interesting because like, yeah, I have an argument for how the tracking numbers are literally an emergent property. Because when you look at, so there's a famous court case called Penoyer v. Neff. And it's about like, it's about like whether or not a court has jury, it, it doesn't really matter. But the court talks about like, well, we don't need to get any, this is like an 1850 Supreme Court case, right? And the court basically says, we don't need to get any more complicated than this, because 99% of the time, somebody's going to be on the property they live on or in the state they live in, because people didn't back in the day, they did not leave. Like if you were, if you were in Idaho, you really had no reason to leave Idaho Ever. You weren't you were getting called to Iowa on murder charges. Yeah, yeah, because you were never in Iowa in the first place. But then cars got invented. And right. people were like, wait, now I can go from Idaho to Iowa in three hours. And Real then quick. this is where this is where this massive explosion of like that's when like with this tech invention of like the railroads and automobiles, when people actually started being able to move around, that's when you need to start tracking because you had to go, wait. Where do those Idaho citizens go? Where are they hiding at now? Oh, yeah. they're in they're in Montana. Got to track them Definitely. down. Yeah. Uh, it, it literally necessitates itself at a certain point because of the way it functions. And it just sort of, like you said, emerges. It just comes about. But uh, Lewis Mumford has this uh, thing that he calls a mega machine. And that's uh, sort of where society is right now. That's not what I was trying to say. What was I going to say about his cities? Lewis Mumford wrote about city construction. He wrote about, uh, the article I wanted to bring up was where he writes about how we've changed the construction of cities so that you can no longer live autonomously in one city anymore. And it's yeah. like what you were saying about the cars increasing the way we travel back and forth. So we've now restructured our cities to where you necessitate a car because you can't get a job, you can't go to school, you can't have kids, get a house, go shopping, do right. everything. Like right. I'm just using my life as an example. I'm not saying this is everybody's goal. I have I mean, kids. This is true I'm across just, like the United I'm States. I'm the general. Yeah. But I have kids, I have, you know, I'm married, I have a house, I just I have a job, I stay right here, but you can't do it all in one city. You just can't, because they changed the way it is. Like, you don't have all of these things in every city anymore. So then you need a car. Once you have a car, you can go farther. So you can then make yourself more adapted to living in that type of city where you have to, you know what I mean? I could drive to Southfield from Detroit every day for work, or I could drive from Detroit to Toledo every day for work. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? They're, they're very similar car rides, but like that's crossing a state boundary, which means they have a different set of stuff going on there. Because like you said, there are these arbitrary distinctions that sort of minor differences in population, but it's like, I can go anywhere around that general area because I have a car, but now I can go even farther 
than what I would have needed to go, which then further exacerbates the city problem. If you have a company who's thinking, how far can our employees travel to get to work when they're considering a new headquarters, everybody having cars and living in a car-based society makes it so they can move much further away, take advantage of much more uh, lax tax laws because everybody can just move around wherever they want. So then that puts anyone who doesn't have that at an extreme disadvantage. I mean, that's why like, it, it, like here, here's a little like fact, almost every single, like not every single, but like the vast majority of like corporations in the United States are incorporated in Delaware because Delaware has like the lowest corporate tax rate by, by far of any state. And most of these corporations that like are literally headquartered elsewhere, they have a PO box in Delaware that like, <laughs> and that's their property in Delaware. And that makes them a company of Delaware. And it's like, yep. it's, it's like systemic, but um, um, so something you brought up was like the construction of cities and then, and, and, and something I want to bring up is zoning laws. Zoning laws yep. are literally an emergent property of cities. Yep. And, um, and we're, we're the cities were like, we don't want, we don't want, this is not a resident. You can't live near your work anymore. You have to live away from this portion of the city. Well, think about this, even like uh, going further back than something that you would envision in color television. We're going back to memories of black and white times, okay? Because mm -hmm. when I think this far back, I only have black and white in my memories. So if you think back to the times when like Henry Ford was coming out with um, assembly lines and things like that, there literally was companies that made entire housing blocks so that their people would move and live there and keep them on the premises. This was all before cars were the main means of transportation. So they made a, tech, a technical solution to something before cars had then taken that solution further. You don't have to have them move to the city. You just have to have them drive to the city. Like think about the Ford plants you see right now. My dad works for Ford. He'll tell me all the time. It's like its own city inside of these plants. They have all their own stuff inside of there. So they kept that sort of thing going. And then they just necessitate the, the the travel. So you, before cars were around as the main means of transportation, the businesses were like, oh, we can just make houses and have everybody live here so that they're stuck right here and do whatever we need them to do. And then again, technology comes, they're doing it to produce cars. So then cars become the main, you know, transportation means. So then they have to take those cars later on in the generations and drive back to the little cities that they made. <laughs> they don't have to live there anymore, which means they don't have to pay as much money on janitors. Well, hey, hey Charlie, uh, uh, we're coming to, coming to the end of our time here, unfortunately. Uh, I hate to, no, I, hate I to totally about. get you. I could chat all day. But yeah. Uh, thank you very much for coming on the show with us and talking to us about tech stuff. This has been like an awesome conversation. Yeah, this was great. No problem. Um, uh, where, where can people go to see some of your stuff? I know you you have a podcast as well, don't you? Uh, yeah, but we're currently not producing any episodes. It was called Cheebly's okay. Playground, C-H-I-B-L-I apostrophe S, Playground, like the normal spelling of Playground. Um, but it was just a board game podcast. We have about 50 episodes out. But I, I haven't really been doing much. Yeah. I've just been kicking these ideas around the old noggin, yeah. but I'm getting back into writing and stuff. So working on that, uh, because I, like I said, I got to work full time. I got to do the kids school and stuff yeah. like that. My time started limited. But after I get done with the, the article for not article, the screaming is doing that book. I'm working on that right now. So, that, you know, anybody listening can check that out once it comes out. I should have a thing in there, hopefully. Um, but, yeah, I'll be talking about some of that. That's what I was writing about. I just got to, you know, keep editing and stuff like that but about you know the current technological situation with the pandemic exposing us to zoonotic diseases is sort of a troubling thing um working in games in there and sort of an aspect of we don't want to find ourselves in checkmate mm -hmm. oh, okay checkmate cool. means the game is over on the next turn like right. if you find yourself in checkmate anything you do you're dead <laughs> you know the game is over before the game is over yeah you see what i'm saying so yeah. if we find ourselves in checkmate we're like, hey guys, we got to do something about this. But if we are in checkmate, no matter what we do, we're dead. The yeah. king dies next turn. Just lay it down, back it up, call it a day. We got to avoid checkmate at all costs. Yep. That's literally the thesis: is that like we could be in that now because we cut down all the trees. Yeah, yeah we we might be on the king piece left. We might, we might be on the last saying, line. If yeah. they get the technology gets a pawn over there and brings the queen back, we're done. We're done. <laughs> but hey, if you guys need anything else too, like if you need a, a fill-in guest or anything like that, just let me know. Absolutely, man. Yeah, We'd love no, to talk was, to you again. Yeah, this was obviously I can drink Monster Energy drinks and chat for hours. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs>
we'll, uh, we'll we'll see you again soon then charlie thanks thanks again for thanks coming for coming on, on. Yeah, hopefully i wasn't a bad guest no no, no, no you, you, you were great this was awesome <laughs> have a good much. one take it Look easy man. To hearing back from you guys pack it up call it a day uh, what i was gonna get say lost. too is how we were talking about low-tech solutions for stuff like think about this you could do stand-up comedy yeah, I was never around before. I'm like, you could tell jokes. That's a tech. That's a technique that exists now, where you don't just have to do plays. You could do jokes. Yeah, people would see that if you had your local village comedian telling jokes all the time. Yeah, <laughs> right. Pack it up. Call it a day. Civilization can get lost.